I spent almost 10 years in the gulag system of the Soviet Union, in spite of the fact that I am an American citizen, born and raised in the United States. какой-то интернационализм. Мы не признавали, не было разницы между немцем, русским, украинцем, французом, чехом, словаком. Национальность не имела значения. Значение имело. Человек ли он? Convoy with dogs and rifles, and we were lined up and marched to this uh, basic camp. I saw written on it, welcome, outside, in, in Russian, of course, Dobro Pajalovat, welcome. The Gulag the Soviet Union's notorious forced labor camps. The system which for more than 50 years made virtual slaves of millions of Russians. And, we are now discovering, tens of thousands of foreigners. The story begins with Lenin, the first communist dictator. This decree, dated 1919, orders the internment of so-called bourgeois foreigners, whose countries were militarily engaged against the fledgling Soviet state. It bears Lenin's signature. From the beginning of the communist state, foreigners who stepped on Soviet soil were in particular danger. After Lenin's death in 1924, the situation was to change for foreigners. It got worse, under the new all-powerful leader, Stalin. During the 30s, idealistic foreigners flocked to Stalin's communist utopia, unaware that they risked arrest even if they were working for the regime. Former French communist Jacques Rossi was one of them. He recently revisited the former KGB headquarters, the Lubyanka, to be officially rehabilitated. Ironically, it is the KGB, now the Russian Ministry of Security, which was charged by Boris Yeltsin with locating former convicts. Colonel Mikhail Kirillin spent 15 years in the KGB tracking down and sending dissidents to the camps. He now works in rehabilitation. Rossi's file records the life of an ardent French communist who spent 10 years as a Soviet agent in France and North Africa before his recall to Moscow and unexplained arrest in 1937. 10 years devotion to the Soviet cause was no defense against arbitrary arrest. Jacques spent 19 years in the Gulag. Rossi's file is only one among a hundred thousand in this single KGB archive. Bernard Germe is retracing a journey he made under duress nearly 50 years ago. Bernard was a French serviceman who wandered accidentally into the Soviet zone of post-war Austria. He was accused of spying and sent to Russia. The prisoners have from 18 to 70 years old. We thought we would never come back 
qu'on partait euh, pour, pour mourir. Et on ne savait pas où. On croyait même qu'on allait aux, aux abattoirs. Le genre des qu'on a vu. Tout l'espoir était perdu. Et pour tous, tous les gens qui étaient avec moi, les pauvres prisonniers, aucun n'avait l'espoir. The railway to the north was built by prisoners, car through the frozen tundra with pickaxes. The prisoners say there is a body for every sleeper along the 2,000 miles of track, which lead to camps deep in the Arctic Circle. Si ça peut servir à quelque chose, utile. This is Vorkuta, one of the most notorious parts of the Gulag system. Dozens of camps in an area the size of France. Here, the temperature drops to minus 50 degrees in winter, minus 10 in the height of summer. One of the least hospitable places on Earth, but also one of the richest in natural resources. Bokuta had vast reserves of coal requiring the labor of hundreds of thousands of slaves. Bon. C'est là-bas ma baraque. C'est la dernière. C'est celle qui va le marché à ouvert là. C'est la dernière là-bas. Au fond. C'est la dernière vers le Mirador, là. Ben, le paysage, il n'y en a pas, c'est la neige. Il n'y avait que de la neige. Le matin, À 6 heures, les soldats passaient dans les baraques, ouvraient les portes, puis ils gueulaient tout le monde debout. Alors tout le monde se levait. S'ils ne se levaient pas, c'était le coup de, les coups de trique, les coups de bâton. Alors on voit celui qui était malade, il avait son coup de bâton, mais il se levait quand même. Il fallait qu'il se lève, autrement il l'aurait tué là-dedans. Il l'aurait tué dans la baraque. Alors tout le monde se levait. Et puis, une fois après, l'appel, il passait, il comptait les gens. Alors, on disait nos noms, notre numéro, le nom, la condamnation, euh, 25 ans de travaux forcés, et le paragraphe 58-6, espionnage. Bon, ma foi, tant pis. Un jour, on était tous réunis devant la porte du camp pour aller au boulot. On était serrés les uns contre les autres. C'était pas l'or, comme il y avait de la neige de chaque côté. Hein. Et au moment de, que notre brigade part au boulot, bon, on était, je sais pas combien, une douzaine peut-être. Bon, il y en a onze qui, qui bougent. Le douzième, il bouge pas, il s'est écroulé. Il est tombé raide, comme un bout de bois, comme un piquet. Il avait gelé sur place. Il faisait moins 60 ou moins 55. Il avait gelé sur place. C'était un noir américain. Ça, je me souviens bien de lui. Un grand. Foreigners worked the mines alongside prisoners from every Soviet republic. 
Ethnic minorities within the Soviet Union were particularly vulnerable during the war. Almost all ethnic Germans from the Volga region of southern Russia were deported or arrested, among them Friedrich Gann. Nationalism не имело значения. Значение имело, человек ли он или нет. Его признавали только тогда за своего, если он оказывался человеком с большой буквы, что в большинстве случаев так и было. Условия в то время были здесь ужасные. В чем они заключались? Первое. Моральный человек, морально был убит. Он не знал, за что он сидит. Он не знал, за что он отбывает столь жуткое наказание в таком суровом крае. Вот условия вот эти, именно тяжелейшие, мало питания и тяжкий физический труд приводил к тому, что многие остались здесь в тундре, они не выжили эти страшные испытания. Остались живы, в том числе я причисляю и себя к ним, которые физически были самые здоровые. Они выжили. Film footage of the men, women and children of the mines was used by the regime to demonstrate the value of re-education of delinquents through the nobility of labor, a euphemism for slavery. А так было, конечно, очень плохо. Это никто себе в настоящее время даже представить не может. Умирало очень много, по шесть, по семь человек в сутки. Их хоронили, конечно, хоронили их как? В общей яме, раздетые абсолютно. Они были до того истощены, что не верилось, что этот человек еще вчера двигался. Доходило до того, что человек, откусив хлеб, не был в силе даже его проглотить, переживать и проглотить. Это самое страшное. Today, the mines are operated by poorly paid but free workers. After completing his 15-year sentence, Friedrich Gann was not allowed to leave the camp zone. Now 74, he still lives in Volkuta town. Immediately after the war, a new wave of foreigners became enslaved. A disparate group, allies liberated from Germany, civilian workers, refugees. They were listed as missing persons or even as deserters by their own governments who knew nothing of their fate. One such victim was American John Noble, whose father had established a camera factory in Dresden in the 30s. Father and son spent the war in Dresden, living under Red Cross protection. He remembers the day that the Red Army came to liberate the city. In 1945, when the Red Army moved into Dresden, we were anxiously wanting to be liberated. The Soviet Army moved up to the city limits during the night, and on May 6, about 6 in the morning, immediately all over the city, white flags were coming up. The city was surrendering. At 8 that morning, the Soviet troops moved in. It was a horrible scene. The raping, the murders, the shooting, the looting, all these things that were far beyond anything that we had heard or we could believe. We personally witnessed much of the horror. The house right next door, they pulled mattresses out on the street, raped the women. Up at the next corner, the, uh, the Soviets had tied a woman to the wheel of a wagon and had pushed a broken bottle into her. We had, many of the women from our factory had been raped over and over and over again, some as many as 20 times a day. Our family was spared this horror at the time because we had an American flag flying on the roof and on the tower. And somehow, the Soviets did not like this. 
and uh, therefore I think uh, some of the preparations were already being made for our arrest. In July 1945, the KGB came for John and his father. They were taken to the local prison, Munchenplatz. For seven months, I was held in a cell just like this. The only difference was here was a metal cot that folded down table and bench folded away. But to be in here for seven months without once setting a foot outside of the door was almost unbearable. Later on, from March 1946 on, I was responsible for the records of the prisoner. If he died, if he was executed, I had to keep those records. Sometimes people were even sentenced to death. And the prisoner was marched out into the other part of the prison building and out there given instructions, turn to the right and turn to the left and so on. And while still turning, the officer would shoot the prisoner in the back of the neck. And then the bodies were shoved into a sunken pit. And then we workers had to roll barrels of gasoline through, which was poured over the bodies and they were burnt. 21,000 cards passed through my hands during the time while I was keeping the records. And out of these 21,000 people, only 15 human beings were ever released. In 1946, after a year in prison, John and his father were sent to the former concentration camp, Buchenwald, site of Nazi atrocities that had recently been revealed to the world. After the war, the camp came under Soviet management. I was here for almost two years, but this was during the communist time. Most people remember Buchenwald from the Nazi time, the horrors that took place. But they don't know what happened afterwards. For 23 days, they tortured me. But I was an American. Other foreign nationals were held here. People from every part of the world were held here during the communist time. But it seemed as though nobody cared. The hunger was unbelievable. The sickness, we had a whole row of barracks where people were just dying away. During the time while I was here, we buried close to 10,000. 10,000 people from all over the world, forgotten, forsaken, forsaken by their governments. John was separated from his father, then moved from camp to camp in East Germany before being condemned, without trial, to 15 more years hard labor and sent north to Vokuta. One-fifth of the Gulag population were women. In 1946, Liliane was a civil servant with the French military mission in Berlin, where she was assigned the job of liaison officer in the Soviet zone. She was arrested at a Soviet checkpoint when they overheard her speaking Russian. Liliane was charged with spying. My première detention was in Karaganda. De là, je suis passé au camp le plus euh, sévère, qui était uniquement pour les espions. Euh, et je, là, j'ai passé euh, huit mois dans un camp qui était extrêmement difficile, où euh, on n'avait rien à manger que le, la nuit. Euh, quand le matin on se levait, il fallait soutenir les personnes qui, qui sont mortes pour pouvoir, euh, pouvoir euh, récupérer la le morceau de pain. Il y avait des Allemands, il y avait des Lituaniennes, il y avait des Ukrainiennes, il y avait des Turcs, il y avait toutes les nations.
j'ai voulu me donner un but pour vivre. Et c'est pourquoi, j'ai euh, un beau jour, je me suis dit, il vaut vivre comme ça, pourquoi vivre Alors j'ai décidé d'essayer d'avoir de, euh, un rapport avec un homme pour avoir, avoir un, un enfant. C'est pourquoi, le, 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 quand j'étais, j'ai pu euh, avoir contact avec euh, un, un ami, une connaissance, je lui ai expliqué tout simplement quel était mon but, que je voudrais avoir un enfant. Et si, euh, alors il a essayé de me dissuader en me disant que tu ne te rends pas compte ce que c'est d'avoir un enfant. Euh, ici, euh, on va, euh, quand euh, il sera né, ils vont te le reprendre, tu ne le reverras jamais et tu ne sais jamais, tu ne sais jamais si tu pourras un jour le, le, le revoir. Je dis, je m'en fiche, mais je, je lutterai pour, euh, pour euh, l'obtenir et je veux un enfant. Et c'est comme ça que j'ai eu mon enfant. Et le jour où mon fils est né, je, plus qu je ne vivais que pour lui. Georges was taken from Liliane at birth and placed in the camp orphanage. At the age of six months, he was taken away for special upbringing. J'avais déjà des échos comme quoi les enfants, on ne les rendait pas. Alors je me suis dit, moi je le retrouverai toujours. Et je, je me suis dit, euh, je vais le marquer comme ça. Personne ne pourra savoir où il est marqué et comment il est marqué. Et je l'ai marqué de façon que... À l'œil, quand on le regarde bien, il a ici une, une, une cicatrice près de l'œil. Liliane was released from the camp in 1955. At first, the authorities denied her son's existence, but finally relented. Mother and child were reunited at a transit camp. They were assigned to East Germany. With the help of a Berlin-based escape organization, Lillian jumped wagons at an overnight siding and was smuggled across the frontier to the west. They reached France six months later. When Georges grew up, angry and confused over his identity and origins, he abandoned his mother. Today there is no contact between them. A new wave of arrests began around the time of Stalin's 70th birthday. By 1950, he was becoming increasingly suspicious of his closest colleagues. On a wider scale, the Cold War rekindled Stalin's paranoia about foreigners, as an arrest list of Soviet and foreign citizens shows. Вот, давайте взглянем. Например, всего в 50-м году Органами безопасности, то есть Министерством госбезопасности, было арестовано 57 238 человек. Англичане, югославы, чехи, албанцы, сербы, шведы, французы, немцы, поляки, румыны, иранцы, афганцы, китайцы, японцы, корейцы, греки, турки... Дания, Бельгия, Швейцарец один попался каким-то образом. Когда ты живешь в окружении людей, я имею в виду охрана, администрация, которые твердо понимают, что ты живой труп, и ты никогда отсюда не вернешься. И не будет тебе никакой там твоей страны. Конечно, в десятерне страшно, когда прервана связь с Родиной когда посольство, которое есть, о тебе совершенно не заботится, когда на тебе, а таких большинство, висят чужие обвинения, ты не виноват в том, за что ты сидишь. Единственное, что бы я сказал, что это страшное дело, потому что и можно бесконечно сочувствовать этим людям, вот тем, кто безвинно оказался в этих лагерях, и это страшнее, чем вот нам. Нам сидеть на своей земле, в своем лагере, зная свой, так, зная свой народ. It was during this period that Englishman Arthur Raffi was arrested. Although brought up in Moscow and married to a Russian, Arthur was given no explanation when the KGB came for him. There was a, the usual midnight knock, which is celebrated in literature. Uh, several officers came in, two of them took me away in a, an ordinary car. 
to the Lubyanka. I was in a daze, of course, because uh, when, when a person is arrested, uh, you don't know where you are. And then I was put in a little cubicle where there was no bed or anything like that, where the light burned all, all the time. And how many days and nights I spent there, I really don't know. Because time had lost all meaning, you see. One day, I was summoned to a cell, and an officer sat there and said, this is your sentence. And he gave me a piece of slip of paper on which was written that the special conference, the OSSO as it was called, had sentenced uh, me, the name was there, 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 to 10 years in the corrective labor camps for anti-Soviet agitation. That was all. Sign, he said. If I don't sign, well, he says, I don't care. I can sign for you. I was taken to the railway station all by myself in this Black Maria, put into a compartment, into a train compartment, and you know, they have these compartments of four bunks, but later they pushed in as many as 16 people into this four bunk compartment, which I was told by the others there was not that bad because there could be as many as 20, 24, even 26 people in this shoved up like this. In the camps, the day dragged, the day, but the months went by rather quickly, strangely, paradoxically enough. But the day itself seemed to never end. At camp, Arthur encountered the Blatnoi, Russian convicts, murderers and thieves chosen for their ability to terrorize and used by the camp guards as warders and spies. The Blatnoi tried to prey on us. I was in a camp where these thieves had agreed to work, you see, although uh, the chief thieves they didn't go out. Jacques Rossi witnessed the cruelty of the Blatnoi. Le Blatnoi, ça veut dire le super voyou. Il risque sa vie. Il ne vit pas longtemps, mais il est vraiment dangereux. Et ensuite, une autre petite scène, c'était déjà dans les camps. Il y avait des Blatnoi qui ont fait leur, euh, leur cours. Ils ont jugé un qui est euh, un de leurs. Et ils ont décidé probablement de le tuer parce que Dans la baraque où j'étais, avec, je ne sais pas, il y avait peut-être une, une dizaine de Blatnoï, nous étions à peu près 250. Et au su, au but de tout le monde, celui qui a reçu l'ordre de, de l'exécuter était venu avec une hache vers le, vers le type qui était couché par terre, qui, qui tremblait, qui avait peur et qui ne se défendait pas. Vous savez, parce qu'il savait très bien ce qui l'attendait, Il ne faisait aucune, aucune tentative de s'évader. De, de... Vous savez, parce que pour un Black Noy, la vie en dehors de son monde, ce n'est pas la vie. Et ben, j'ai vu alors le type euh, sous, euh, faire ce geste avec la hache. J'ai voulu me lever, alors, euh, parce que vous voyez le principe, personne en danger. Vous savez, c'est quand même quelque chose qui est dans, dans nous. Quoi. Et aussitôt, mon voisin de, qui m'a mis sa patte, il avait une patte énorme, c'est un paysan, il m'a mis la patte sur, sur la tête pour, pour me presser contre, contre la couchette. Et ben j'ai entendu le bruit, et puis la tête qui, qui a sauté. March 1953, Stalin died. Prisoners' hopes were raised across the Gulag archipelago. Stalin's successors at the Kremlin issued a partial amnesty that spring, although ironically it applied mainly to criminals rather than political prisoners. Hundreds of thousands of the dreaded Black Noi were released, as Arthur Raffi witnessed. Before the uh, convicts were to go out, we had a little orchestra. I played the violin. And uh, we had an officer a junior lieutenant, a young guy, whose name was Moroz, 
who was the head of what was called the cultural and educational section, which was uh, a stupidity, but still it existed. So on that particular day, I remember he got up on the platform and said, uh, there are, we've had many happy things happening of late, recently. He stopped. In the first place, our dearly beloved leader, Comrade Stalin, has died. After which, there was a roar from these 800 <laughs> convicts, and he didn't say anything else. That is probably one of the most remarkable things I've ever heard. A feeling of frustration spread in the camps that summer. The prisoners demanding more food, contact with their families, and a review of sentences. The frustration erupted into strikes. At the beginning of the strike, people were fearful because most prisoners, being Russians, never ever experienced the opportunity of saying no. And here for the first time, they said, no, we're going to put down our tools. We're not going to go along with this any longer. So there was tremendous fear. But as it went on, more courage was gathered so that we were, we were convinced we were going to accomplish what we wanted to. I can still remember the day when General Maslenikov came to Vorkuta. He came to our camp and he came to many other camps. And he asked us to stand up and to speak up. He said, everyone has the freedom to speak. Nobody will be punished. And still nobody stood up. So he repeated that time and time and time again. And then finally, about 20 men did stand up. The first one was a professor of history from the Leningrad University. And he said, I know that for what I have to say, I'll receive at least another 10 years to my sentence. And General Masnikov said, no, no, nothing will happen to you. You have the freedom to speak. And so this professor recalled every stage of slavery in the history of mankind. And when he came to the present situation, he said, General, never has there been a slavery as brutal and as inhuman as the slavery which we're experiencing right now. He did not receive his 10 years. He was shot. Примерно 10 часов по всем громкоговорителям вот вокруг зоны, которые были вот установлены на столбах, была команда: "Выйти всем на работу". Вот в противном случае будут приняты строгие меры. Это было оглашено вот так краткий приказ. Ну, конечно, вот э, заключённые, которые били, они этому не подчинились. General Maslenikov came to Vorkuta with two divisions of KGB forces. They dug their trenches around the camp, and on August 1st, they opened fire. Когда я находился, я был около седьмого барака в Квете выжил. Значит, я когда уже нас подняли и выгоняли из зоны с поднятыми руками и руками такая за головой, я пробежал вот здесь два было барака для администрации. Я мимо них пробежал, ну и здесь был вот конечно дымом стал. Вот такая гора была трупу где-то метра три-четыре. Когда проходил мимо, здесь вот с одной стороны и с другой стороны стояли солдаты с дубинками. Попадать по эти дубинки было, конечно, нежелательно. Знаете, я пробежал краешком дороги уже по крови. А кровь из этой кучи трупов стекалась в сторону вахты. Где-то метров, может, на 15. Все было залито кровью. I was not hit. A friend next to me was hit and his blood just splattered all over me, but I was not injured. Everyone then fell down, tried to protect themselves by something or somebody. And uh, this was only a very short shooting. It seemed as though it was going on for hours, but probably only for minutes. No one knows how many were executed in the wave of strikes across the Soviet Union. A report did reach the United Nations, and the Soviet delegate promised justice. No trials ever took place. Looking back on the rebellion, 
I personally believe it was most important because that was 1953. It was not 1983. So there were 30 years of horror going on in the Soviet Union that could have been eliminated. In other words, for 30, almost a whole generation suffered longer because our strike did not succeed. But the Gulag had changed. After Khrushchev took control, more releases were sanctioned. The total population of convicts and internal exiles fell from an estimated 5 million in Stalin's last years to about 1 million in 1959. Many of the foreigners were released. The barrack master, the one who was in charge of my barrack, came rushing into the Stalova, where I was ready to eat my evening meal. And he shouted at the top of his voice, Americanos, ti josh domoy. American, you're going home. Now, at first, I didn't want to believe it. Because when you hear this once or twice, and it is not true, it almost destroys you. I left the camp the very next morning. It was a three-day trip to Moscow. When we arrived, a tailor came to our cell, measured our bodies for new clothing, and we felt this is it, we're going home. But when we left that prison, the train was going eastward instead of westward, and that was an enormous disappointment. We were taken to the Camp Pochma, a camp where only foreigners are held that are to be released. Some are there for a month, some are there for a year, some two, three years, depending upon how long it takes to get their health back up, get their, let their hair grow again, fatten them up a little bit. And uh, even there, I was not sure as to when I would be set free. Ten years after his arrest, John Noble was repatriated. Today, he has reopened the family factory in Dresden. But he is still uneasy. They say communism is no longer. The KGB still is there. I am not convinced that there are, that the camps have all been opened up because there are too many foreigners who have not come home. John's suspicions are shared by Memorial, a human rights organization founded to protect the interests of former prisoners. They are compiling an independent record of the Gulag. It is to the former KGB they must turn for some of their information on specific cases. Colonel Mikhail Kirillin of the Rehabilitation Department is the link. It is an uneasy relationship on both sides. Уже в первый период работы нашей группы мы поняли, что менталитет Комитета государственной безопасности не позволяет подчас и иностранцам, и журналистам обращаться напрямик к нам. The work of Memorial will take years and relies on volunteers like former university lecturer Nikolai Morozov. Morozov follows up leads uncovered in the archives. He is currently compiling a file on the town of Pechora, where it is known that thousands of prisoners were held, including Americans, Britons, Poles, Finns, Hungarians, Chinese, and Koreans. A series of leads recently brought Morozov to this house, the home of 88-year-old Japanese Niet Nigai, who is cared for by the couple who share his assigned living space. He was arrested in 1931 while studying in Moscow, and until Memorial discovered him, 
he had had no contact with his family, who believed him dead. Recently, he received a packet of photographs from a nephew in Japan whom he did not know existed. Morozov's mission is not only to trace former convicts, but also to uncover the stories of guards and administrators. One day he hopes there will be a proper accounting. Конечно, многие из них живы, находятся на заслуженной пенсии, получают льготы. Мы сейчас проедем мимо дома, где живет Попов Александр Александрович, бывший начальник Воркутинских лагерей. Сейчас прямо по интернациональной, дом 106. Видимо, следующий, вот этот, да, где загрузка. Political officer in charge of the Volkuta camps, Popov's nickname was the Purifier. Ровно 50 лет, как я в партии. Я никогда не изменял этим идеям, потому что идеи партии за трудовой народ. И сейчас не изменяю, и сейчас состою в партии. Коммунисту. Сейчас очень трудно. После. Я только я уже повторю, что мы... Даже не подозревали этого кошмара, который у нас делался там, вот, а мы слепо выполняли, хорошо ли, плохо ли, разные были среди нас люди, да. поэтому в нашем понимании это не было. Мы так понимали, есть преступники, их судят, вот, они где-то должны работать, где-то отбывать, понимаете, да. И что это не чистая, а грязная работа. Мы не по своей воле там работали, нас послали туда, да. Все это понятно, да. Ведь мы же тогда гордились. Гордились. Вот нас вот, а, доверие какое, понимаете? И потом вдруг... Да, вдруг, гоп, и, и упал, и все это. И потом стали стесняться, что мы работали. Вот ведь как. Вот ведь как. Разве это по-человечески не горько? Правильно, я этого не боюсь, потому что я здесь работал, здесь остался. Если были хвосты, я бы удрал. Меня здесь после этого продолжить правильно. А что же, на, на Шкодил отвечай. И, тем более, что я в эти дела мне совершенно спокоен. Да. Arthur Raffi, like Alexander Popov, is still adjusting to the tremendous upheavals that have taken place over the past decade. For Arthur, these social and political changes have helped lay to rest the Gulag ghosts. <laughs> Personally, I am very happy with the situation. I like the fact that the KGB, I keep my fingers crossed, is no more. Of course, materially, it's a bit hard, but I've lived through harder situations than that. When I was out in the cold, as I call it, up north, in my wildest dreams, 
I never thought I would ever live to see such a thing. In spite of Arthur's optimism, life remains hard for many former prisoners and their families. In the Volkuta region, some still live in former camps. They have nowhere else to go. The political changes have yet to liberate everyone from their fear, as Nikolai Morosov knows from experience.